Good morning, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Peaceful Bird Gardens. It is a beautiful day here in zone 10A, which means that it is incredibly hot and oppressively humid. So we had rain this morning and uh, it's soupy out here, um, but I'm very, very happy. We have been getting regular rain here in the gardens. It hasn't been like going around us like it seemed to do last year. Now, today we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to show you some of the propagation that I do. As long as it doesn't rain, we're supposed to get a little more rain this morning. So I may have to come back later after the rain, but I thought I would get out here early and um, try and get some filming done because I missed you guys last week. I wasn't out here last week um, recording because I was, I was busy full catastrophe of life and all that. I um, had a very busy schedule and I've been doing consultations this summer for folks. So for those of you that don't know, I do offer gardening consultations locally in the Tampa Bay, specifically Pinellas, South Pasco, uh, West Hillsboro area. If you have, you know, if you want to start a food forest or if even if you just want to grow a few fruit trees or, you know, plant some natives, I'm happy to come and help you out with that. So you can go to my website for more details on that. I actually just did a consultation in South County, South Pinellas County yesterday for a wonderful couple uh, who already know quite a, they know, they already know quite a lot. They, they do. Their instincts were very good so <laughs> but it's fun it's really really fun I love doing them it gives me a chance to meet new people and to build community and to talk about plants and the environment so and the mosquitoes it's summer in Florida so back to what we're doing today uh, today as I mentioned I'm gonna try to go around and do some prob it's a good time of year with the rain happening I've got little volunteer plants popping up and if you're not familiar with what a volunteer plant is a plant volunteer is kind of what it sounds like so there are certain plants that especially my little wildflowers and some of the annuals back here like my brassicas they produce seeds at the end of their season their life you know and those seeds get spread by wind or birds or what have you and then little plants pop up and we call those volunteers. <laughs> so I have little natives, uh, specifically frost weed, a gorgeous plant. I absolutely love it, but it's very prolific when it reseeds, which to me is just free plants. And I take these plants to the Florida Native Plant Society meetings to give away and share. I have quite a few frost weeds, so I won't <laughs> I won't take you through all of them, but uh, I'm going to pot some of these up and I'll show you how I do that. I also have, I think, a Fakahatchee grass that popped up and possibly some tropical sage because it's another plant that I have that loves to kind of <laughs> spread itself around the garden, which again, I find lovely because I haven't had to buy tropical sage since the first maybe handful of plants that I bought because they just pop up on their own and then I move them to where I would like them to be. And something that I have found when it comes to transplanting the plants that have a more weedy nature is that uh, even when I think that they're just, they're done, they're not going to make it. Like after I transplant them, they look very sad. They're just like, you know, you suck. <laughs> Why did you do this to me? I was just fine where I was that uh, they come back, they come back, leave them alone, give them some water, you know, leave them alone. And in my experience, for the most part, most of them tend to put down roots and come back, you know, even when I think they're dead. So that's wonderful. That's another wonderful thing about weedy, you know, natives is, you know, they're pretty tough, like um, Ravinia humilis. That's one of them that I had transplanted and thought for sure that it wasn't going to survive and keep going, but nope, they made it. They're good they're looking great. So I'll take you around and show you some of that. And also I'm going to take some cuttings for a friend of mine, uh, some of the Tythonia diversifolia cuttings, as well as some of the basil that I like to grow. Uh, I'm going to be sharing that with a friend. And so I'll, I'll show you how I do that. Perhaps some chaya and some sisu spinach as well. And two, 
of my pineapples are ready to harvest. I thought I was only going to get one, but my sugar loaf did a weird thing. It's not very big. The last sugar loaf we got was huge. This sugar loaf, it's a little, it's, it, it's a little guy. It's just a little, it's a little thing, but it's already started turning yellow. Like it's ready to be harvested. Now I didn't do a very good job of removing the little babies that had formed around the pineapple. And that's probably why it didn't get to its full potential. So, you know, um, learning experience, it's all good. I'm excited to have the babies too. So, um, we'll take a look at that plant and I'll harvest that and, um, show you what we'll do with those little babies that come up in your pineapple plants. There's two forms. There's a pup and a slip. I believe are the two types of babies that you can get from a pineapple plant, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, we'll have to I'll have to I'll have to double check my, my my sources for that information. Speaking of being wrong about things, I'm so distraught, you guys. <laughs> I I just don't even know what to say. <sighs> when I it, it's okay, we'll get through this together. <laughs> when I did the native plant tour my live oak tree or my oak tree my oak tree in the front that i kept that i you know said was a live oak tree it's not a live oak tree it's a laurel oak tree. i actually love laurel oak trees i know they get a bad rap from people but that's because you don't really know them you don't really understand them so get to know them a little better and maybe you wouldn't have such a bad attitude about them but <laughs> laurel oaks um they're a beautiful tree they don't live as long as a live oak but they're absolutely gorgeous. I, have you ever had that, have you ever had the experience that someone says something to you at one point in your life and you just take it as gospel? You just take it as the absolute truth? <laughs> Don't even think to check. To, I know, okay, in all fairness to me, live oaks and laurel oaks, they are very similar looking, you know. There are differences. <laughs> there you know I someone like me should know these and I do but I, yeah I, I got it wrong guys it happened I got it wrong the tree that lives on my property and has been here for a long time I got it wrong I can be wrong <laughs> it's a wonderful learning experience Danny is not always right um, and I don't claim to be I don't claim to be right all the time so correction the live oak tree in the native section, or I'm sorry, it's not a live oak tree in the native section, it's a laurel oak tree. And the bark on those are quite different. The live oak bark is much more furrowed, uh, much deeper over time. Uh, laurel oak trees have kind of a mm, whitish gray bark and it's not, not as deeply furrowed. The acorns are different as well. Um, live oak acorns tend to be a little bit more elongated, whereas laurel oak acorns like we have are a little more squatty they're a little squattier and the leaves are slightly different though those can be a little bit confusing because you can get a lot of variation of leaves on the same exact tree so that's not always a good indicator but there you have it i screwed up <laughs> so i'll tr probably end up changing the description of that video to reflect that yeah i was wrong all right Good stuff though, good stuff, is that uh, we planned our vacation for the fall. I'm very excited about this trip. So we did not take a trip last year because, you know, we're not rich. We're just a normal average household and we needed to do some work on our house last year. And so our, you know, savings went towards taking care of the house. Well, this year we are, our, our children are adults and we don't, we don't know, you know, if these types of family vacations are going to be happening regularly in the future or not so we have them at home still so we're going to take our boys to we have two actually uh two and a child of our heart <laughs> um adult children two boys um and then our bradley is a child of our heart uh, we're going to california in the fall we're going to yosemite and then we are uh, taking them through silicon valley because kids these days you know they like the tech stuff so we're going to take them through there and um, on our way to san francisco to uh, see mirror woods the whole reason i'm going 
are plants people it's plants it's always plants for Danny it's always nature it's always being out you know being in the mountains and that sort of thing so we're going to Yosemite and I get to see the giant sequoias and when we get to San Francisco we'll go to Mirror Woods and I'll get to see the coastal redwoods and I'm I'm very excited about this trip I'm very excited about being with my boys in this space and I mean, with the wildfire fires, you know, with the wildfires and stuff that go on in California, no time like the present. <laughs> you just never know. So that's something that's going on for us. We're going on vacation in the fall. Um, so obviously I, I won't be, um, I might try to do some recording while I'm out there and just share it on the channel. That might be fun. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I will. All right. So the annual area is looking good. Our okra are growing beautifully. Uh, the beans are doing really, really well. It's not covering as much of the area. I mentioned this last time uh, that germination just didn't happen for a lot of the things that I tried seed-wise because I was a little late, but it's still good. Like I'm, I'm okay with the way things are going in the beans and I've already harvested some of our black eyed peas. So what I'm doing, I'm going to be making, I was hoping to be able to show that to you today, but I don't know if I will. That may have to happen in another video. I need to make some alfalfa meal tea and that's something else that this summer I'm supplementing that area with just to try to build up the nutrition the organics to help try to alleviate the stress from root knot nematodes that are I don't know if it's going to work but I keep trying and I keep putting a chop and drop in there and mulch and trying to build up that soil fertility. But I'm happy with what's going on in there currently because my okra plants look really great. My roselle plants that I planted look really great. It's been raining, so everything is growing like mad right now. Our cherry trees, our Barbados cherries are still producing. I may have to net those. I have come to the conclusion that I may have to look into some bird netting for uh, my my strawberry tree and my Barbados cherry trees because I think the birds may be getting I don't mind sharing but they're they're getting to a lot of the fruit so what I may end up doing is looking into some oh there's a little little birds coming to the feeder I've got a little tub to tip mouse at the feeder so I may look for some lightweight there's just no such thing from what I've discovered. There's no such thing as eco-friendly bird netting. It's all some form of plastic. It's just, you know, because I guess anything else wouldn't really hold up very well or be super heavy. So I think I found something that I'm, I can live with and we can use it year after year if we store it correctly. So I'm going to kind of cover the trees like you would like a lollipop wrapper <laughs> because the unfortunate thing about bird netting is if you don't if you if you're not careful with how you put it on you can actually trap birds in the bird netting and injure them or even kill them and that's not what i'm looking for i love birds this is peaceful bird gardens so we're going to do everything in our power to preserve and protect the birds but also preserve and protect our fruit and just put it over top of it and then cinch it at the uh you know at the trunk like a lollipop and that's the other benefit about keeping you know the trees at a smaller size is that doing this is much much easier i don't need a bunch of material and a ladder and like three people to, to do this i could realistically do it myself without a ladder at you know whatsoever so that's something that i'm i'm gonna have to do and uh when i do it i will try to do a video and show, you know show you the material that i ended up getting which as i mentioned is not necessarily going to be eco-friendly but um, I'll show you, you know, the, the process of, of how we do it and how I end up securing it at the base. And we'll see how it goes. You know, I may hate it. <laughs> I may say to heck with it and I get what I get and the birds get what they get. And, and that's just the way that it is. But, um, we do have sugar apple fruit growing. I have a little sugar apple that's forming and I believe I have two more flowers that may end up being fruit. So that's fantastic. The bananas continue to grow and get fat and, and nice. So, so that's another wonderful thing that's going on in the garden. All right, my sweet friends, let's go harvest some pineapples and do a little propagation. All right, my sweet friends. So we're going to start with my, we're going to start with my weird little uh, sugarloaf pineapple here that I didn't think would be ready <laughs> for some time, but I ended up having to put a, uh, 
a wedge here just to kind of prop her up because once this started getting any kind of weight to it the whole plant just kind of toppled and that happens i've had that happen with other pineapples too so i just kind of prop them up to give them a bit of support but i'm going to take that out now because i want to show you if you can hopefully you can see this see how small <laughs> i have no idea and I, like i said i'm thinking possibly that it was because i allowed these little slips here to continue to grow without removing them now these little babies here that pop up just at the base of the pineapple are slips and then you get other little plants that grow sometimes and i will try and show a picture of one because i have one down here this is a sucker or a pup that grows out of the base of the plant itself so the Either one will make, you know, will grow into a whole new pineapple plant that will produce a pineapple. The nice thing about these, the little slips and the pups, is that with a top, this pineapple top may or may not be worth growing. Of course, I'm going to give it a shot, but it may not be. From when you get a pineapple from the store and you grow it from its top, that can take two years to actually produce a pineapple. And then once that flower comes out you know of the plant it takes five months for the pineapple depending on the variety uh, it takes about five months for them to actually become ripe like this so that you can harvest them uh, but these little babies will produce sometimes within a year you plant them they get to a certain size they put out a flower and then you're you're good so i've said this in previous videos once you have pineapples you have pineapples because you know, this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is seven plants, seven plants right here. And then I have another one here at the base, uh, you know, a sucker or a pub that I will just let take over this plant, the mama plant here. I will just let this slip, or I'm sorry, a sucker take over for the plant that's going to die off once I harvest this pineapple. And then these are the little babies I will either give to friends or I will plant them other places within the food forest. So how I harvest this, I have multiple methods. Sometimes when it's small like this, just do that, I just break it off. Um, and you'll sometimes notice that ants um, have been putting little mealy bugs and things like that, but I've, I haven't noticed that it actually damages the fruit because this is quite tough. The outside of the pineapple is quite tough. So one cute little pineapple down. We'll see how I'm going to let it continue to ripen on the counter for a few days. And um, it should be wonderful. It smells, oh, it smells heavenly. It smells like a pineapple. It smells like a tropical island <laughs> in my imagination. Um, so then these little, I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. These little babies and they don't have roots but that's not a big deal because i mean they don't have visible roots i can see little oh that's just smut sometimes you can see little root like here i see little rootlets that are getting ready to form i don't know if you can see that my camera stinks at the close-ups but um, these little rootlets will eventually become roots and you just stick these into some shallow you know stick them shallowly into some soil so they don't topple over and moist soil and keep it moist and they will root down for you so you just break these off as well just break them off okay so one pineapple down all right my sweet friends so hopefully you can see this it's a little awkward angled but this is the pineapple that i showed you in a previous video that i covered and protected and it is now ready to be harvested and of course i forgot my cutting tool one minute let me grab my cutting tool all right so i'm wearing my favorite garden shirt today it is not the best for being in a swampy sweaty environment because it's 100% um, cotton but i tend to gravitate towards natural fabrics somebody made a comment on the last video about my kindness t-shirts from life is good and i highly recommend life is good um i really like their their stuff kindness is very important on this channel it's just important in general and um yeah i think we can all be you know a little bit kinder to each other maybe the world wouldn't wouldn't be in the place that it's in if uh kindness is very important i know some people i think believe that kindness can be a weakness but there's nothing stronger there's nothing stronger than being a kind person it's easy to go the other way
kindness takes kindness takes something so that's just my two cents but now look at this beautiful baby so i don't let them go too long this is perfect for me color wise it's you know just starting to really deepen the yellow along the base here and if i leave it any longer i might not get it <laughs> so so i'm being very selfish and i'm going to harvest my pineapple right now and as i said i usually just give it a good twist and just pop it off just like that oh look at that that is a gorgeous pineapple right there very excited and oh it smells it smells beautiful this is something else that i that i look for i wait for is um when they have that nice sweet pineapple-y kind of a smell now this one again i will absolutely grow this from the t uh, grow you know this plant i will grow it from the top and i'll show you how i prepare the tops once this is ripe and ready to cut into and uh, when that's when it's ready i will also do a little video showing you how i grow this from the top and also what this and the little the little guy uh, that I just took inside the house tastes like. So we'll do a tasting video coming up soon. But this needs to sit on my counter for a good few days to continue to fully ripen. Very exciting times. All right, my sweet friends. So I am over here next to the chaya because I have a friend that would like some chaya. And so I'm going to show you how I propagate it. It's so, it's so simple. So chaya, if you actually take a cutting of chaya and just lay it on the ground, it'll start to root. It just will. And it's starting to sprinkle. So we'll see how this goes. Luckily, my camera is waterproof. <laughs> oh, there's, oh, there's a little bird nest up there, you guys. I have a little cardinal nest up there. So I have to be, I think, I think they've pledged. Now I hear woodpeckers. So it's very interesting. I um, used to rehabilitate, I, I spent years rehabilitating birds and um this time of year is all about baby birds starting like i don't know february march is time frame and going through like to august september yikes baby birds <laughs> it's a full-time job well usually the woodpeckers <clears throat> are last for whatever reason they tend to be later season uh, procreators so i've heard little baby red belly woodpeckers in the garden this morning it's so exciting and um probably a load off of the mind of people who are re rehabilitating babies right now knowing that the season is coming to an end for another year so chaya so let's see i'm going to take And again, you want to cut in between the nodes. Now I took a big chunk because I can actually make multiples with this, multiple propagates with this one plant. I have to be very careful with chaya. They have a milky sap that comes out when, you know, when they're injured. And uh, that makes me itch something fierce. So I have to wear gloves and be super cautious whenever I'm around chaya. So just keep that in mind if you have skin, skin allergies or sensitivities. So, what you can do is just take a good, I don't know, six inch section of this and stick it in some moist soil. And I'll show you how I do that. I'll just break off this piece here. Give it a nice clean, clean cut in between the nodes. So just give it a nice clean cut in between the nodes like that. Uh, I'll probably remove part of this top section because we don't need all of that excess green strip away some of these leaves and be mindful of the leaves too because uh, this is their scientific name <laughs> nidoscalus they they mean business there are these little stinging hairs underneath and some people don't get bothered by these but as i mentioned i'm kind of sensitive so these these have um, gotten embedded in my skin and it just doesn't feel very good um, chaya is an edible green and it's related to jatropha the ornamental uh, plant you can see the similarities in their leaves believe it or not and in the flowers that they produce these produce white flowers that the pollinators really love um, but jatropha also put out red flowers that actually attract butterflies and hummingbirds uh, but if i'm being honest i'd rather have the edible <laughs> the edible version you need to cook the leaves though because these have hydrocyanic compounds uh, so you have to cook the leaves for at least 
10 to 15 minutes, boil that out, discard the water, and then you can use the cooked greens however you would use a cooked green. They're delicious, they're highly nutritious, full of protein, so I highly recommend chaya if for your food forest. And they're just beautiful plants. They don't get super large unless you allow them to. And um, yeah, just fantastic multi-purpose plants for the food forest. Now this, I will again take, take a pot with some soil and just jam it in. <laughs> Just, just, just kind of, you know, wiggle it in, wiggle it into the pot. Make sure you pack it down, pack it down, pack it down, pack it down. And then that will form roots all along those nodes and these roots very easily, very quickly. Just keep it moist and you have yourself a whole new little chaya plant. Okay, my friends, another edible green that is actually super easy to propagate is sisu spinach. And I talked about sisu spinach last year when I did the video on perennial greens. Now, sisu spinach is a ground cover and it puts out these not really showy, but cute little white flowers along the stems. And I have noticed pollinators really do like them. So what you, what you can do with sisu, it's so simple. It really is easy to create new copies of this. You just take a little cutting, probably about that size. And <laughs> this time of the year, things get to the sisu spinach. So I have lots of it around just so we have a variety of things to harvest from because the slugs and, you know, little caterpillars and things like that just tend to go after it in the summertime. So you just take a little cutting like that and just cut off these lower leaves and again just like with the others they will root along all of these little nodes here and these roots so easily so quickly I can actually see little root hairs at the nodes so what you would do again you can either stick this in some water I have rooted them that way in the past and or you can stick them in some moist soil that's the way I generally do it, but I have done it, you know, by sticking them in water in the past. And you just stick them in some moist soil in a little pot like this. Keep them moist for about two weeks, and then you will have a whole new little sisu spinach plant to either spread around your garden or share, you know, with your friends and family. So sisu spinach has oxalate, it's also called Brazilian spinach or poor man's spinach. I've heard it called all sorts of things. It's very tasty. It has a very crisp texture to it. It does contain oxalates, just like, you know, normal, you know, the spinach that you buy at the grocery store. So just keep that in mind. If you are sensitive to oxalic acids or oxalates, then you might need to either cook sisu or avoid it altogether. But it's a beautiful uh, ornamental ground cover, even if you don't use it as a food plant for the food forest. So sisu spinach. All right, my sweet friends. So I'm in the back food forest area in one of my patches of sweet potatoes that are back here, braving the mosquitoes because it's just that time of the year. I just harvested one of our sweet potatoes so I can show you. So as I mentioned, so I think I mentioned this in the past that we essentially grow sweet potatoes all year long, all year round. In this climate, I can really plant them whenever because we don't get freezes. So I generally plant them in the springtime. I do. I just plant them early to late spring and then we will harvest them in late fall, early winter time. But I believe I planted these last fall and so they are ready now. And this is a jewel sweet potato, I want to say. Uh, one of my favorite varieties. I'm currently growing three different varieties. One a friend gave me, and I don't have the name of because I don't think she realized what it was, um, but I'm growing a mystery, um, a jewel sweet, which is this, and we're also growing Beauregard uh, variety of sweet potatoes. Now, sweet potatoes are super hands-off. I love sweet potatoes for the garden or food forest or whatever because they are multifunctional. Now they obviously create these which are absolutely delicious and ridiculous variety of things that you can do with sweet potatoes but they also act as a ground cover so it's very very important to shade the ground, cover the soil, 
because that protects your soil microbes. And you can also, with sweet potatoes, eat the leaves. I prefer the new leaves to, say, some of the older leaves that have, you know, been around for a little while. They get kind of tough. But the new leaves, when they're quite tender, are not bad. So you can eat them raw or cooked. Now, the flat, they also flower. They put out these really beautiful morning glory looking flowers that the pollinators really love. So just a very versatile, wonderful plant to have in your garden or food forest and relatively easy. I do recommend full to part sun because in order to produce this, they have to have quite a bit of energy. So full to part sun for sweet potatoes. The vines will grow in shade. You just won't get nice big, you know, sweet potatoes like this. And you can grow sweet potatoes in containers. This actually came out of one of my container garden <laughs> beds here that I have. Um, I have these very, very large, they were actually plant planter pots. They're like 30 gallon <laughs> planter pots. Uh, one of them I found along the side of a highway. And so I turned them into planters. And that's generally speaking, sometimes how I grow my sweet potatoes. Oh, there's little cardinals in the garden. Now, sweet potatoes, this is a red potato and we also grow red potatoes here but these i grow in the fall winter time because we just can't grow uh, this type of white potato here through the summertime the plants just they just don't do well i i i've tried it a little bit into early summer and the plants just got disease pooped out and they didn't really put out great potatoes but i grow potatoes every year every october i plant this type of potato. And these, what you can do with, you know, white potatoes, you just wait for the little eyes to show up and then you can actually cut them. Like I could cut this in half because eyes would form here on this end and eyes would form here on this end. And I could cut it in half, plant those two halves, and then the plants will show up. And then over time, they develop these little white potatoes underneath of the soil. Sweet potatoes are slightly different. Now you can, wait for this to sprout because it will over time you know if you leave it out on the counter I've had this happen or if you were to you know do the traditional trick of sticking this you know sticking a, a half of this into take some toothpicks and I'll try and show an image of that if I can I've seen people do it this way you cut it in half you take little toothpicks you put it over top of or you just sit it slightly in a glass of water and it'll put out little shoots and little roots and then you can take those slips off of the top and then what I do is I will take those little rooted sweet potato slips and plant those. I have planted sweet potatoes that had little shoots coming off of it. I've just planted the whole sweet potato. I wasn't super successful. Most of the plants died because the sweet potato just kind of rotted under the ground and took the plants with them. I did have like one or two that, that made it. But so for the most part, what I'll do, I just wait until these start to create little sprouts or you can just stick this in some moist soil and it'll do the same thing. It'll put up little sweet potato sprouts that you can just kind of break off stick those into some soil and then you'll get a vine just like this. Now once you have a vine all you need to do to create more plants is just take some cuttings. So I don't know I usually take oh that one's no good I, I had a break in it but I usually you can take a slip about this size and all along these little leaf nodes they will put out roots. They'll just root all the way along here. And each place where they root down is the possibility of a sweet potato. So what I normally would do was just remove some of these lower leaves, like so. You too. Remove some of these lower leaves. And you can either stick this into a little plant pot with some moist soil like so, just kind of gently, let me stick my finger in there. But let me create a hole so I'm not damaging the little tip there. So you just take some moist soil, stick your little sweet potato slip down in, keep that moist 
for a couple of weeks and it'll put out roots for you. You can also stick them in a glass of water. So you can, or you know, a cup of water or something like that to get them to root. And I normally will do that if I'm sharing them with folks. I will take multiple slips and just stick them in some water, let them root out all over the place. They form very lovely roots and then you can transplant that into your garden or into some soil. So that, my lovely friends, is how you make more sweet potatoes. And we'll get, uh, per vine, we'll get dozens of sweet potatoes depending on, you know, how much sun the sweet potato vine is actually getting. So sweet potatoes, multi-purpose, wonderful plant for the garden or food forest. And something else too, you don't necessarily need to go you know, to a special place to get sweet potatoes. I get mine from the organic market or from the farmer's market. I do try to get organic always, but you don't have to go online and you know, get special slips or anything. You can just go to a store that carries good quality produce, organic produce, and you know, pick up sweet potatoes that would be good for your climate. And in this climate, jewel sweet potatoes and Beauregard tend to do really, really well. So a little tip for you. All right, my sweet friends, so this, beautiful little native volunteer beside me is frostweed. And as I mentioned at the beginning, frostweed is one of those just native wildflowers that is very prolific with their seeds. And I find them all over the place, but I don't mind because then I have plants to give to people. Um, and I also, <laughs> I have a Biden's alba that just shot up right here and it hasn't started to flower yet. So I'm going to, oh, that was my steak from earlier. I'm going to just pull these out of the ground now, because I have plenty of Biden's Alba in the garden and I don't, I don't need more. So I love Biden's Alba. I really do beggar's tick, um, which is nettle. It's called all kinds of things, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So, so I'm going to take my shovel with this little native baby. Now they tend to get, they tend to get woody. They tend to get woody at the base. And sometimes if I don't get to them when they're young, this is a little older than I would like to be removing out of the ground because she's really started to put down some good roots, but I just can't have her growing here. It's, she gets very, very tall and in the way and she'll just drive us nuts. So we are going to do our best to give, give her a, a new, a new home in a, in a nicer location. So, for me, the key to transplanting successfully is getting enough, as much as you can, of the root, you know, of their root system. It's not always easy to do, but you just do the best you can. So I try to come out a ways and see where we are and see, you know, at what point the plant starts to move when I kind of push up. But you want to kind of go in a circular, circular kind of motion all the way around the root or where you kind of assume the root area to be because you really do want to try and get as much of it as you possibly can and you just pop once you get it loosened kind of I kind of reach under it's not so much that I'm looking to get like a, a, a root ball I just want to get as much of the roots as I possibly can so see you can see that so I tried to preserve as much of her little roots as possible. As you can see, they went down kind of far. And so I have a pot here and I just kind of keep garden, just regular garden soil around because when it comes to my natives, I don't worry about using my really nice soil, potting soil that I make for my natives because they don't they don't require that they don't need anything special so i just give them whatever garden soil i happen to have on hand that's what i used to pot them up with that's essentially what they're growing in so just kind of snuggle them into the pot just kind of snuggle them in a ways get their roots all tucked in And you might, when it's a plant that this, that's this tall, you might want to plant her a little, a little deep, not so deep that 
she suffocates, but a little bit deep because there's, you know, she might topple over. This is going to look like I killed her tomorrow. All of these beautiful leaves and everything are going to just wilt and she's going to look like the saddest girl at the prom <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but then she should be fine. I've, I've had them bounce back quite nicely. So there we go. One little potted up native to take to a Florida Native Plant Society meeting or give to one of my friends um, that doesn't necessarily belong to the Florida Native Plant Society. So, there we go. And again, whenever you have transplants, just make sure that you are keeping them moist on a regular basis. It really is like a new plant. So just, you know, that, just make sure that they're getting sufficient watering so that they can establish good root systems. And I will let these root in their pots for a good two weeks before I generally share them with people. But you can always give them to them sooner. Just let them know that you just transplanted it and it's going to take some time for it to put down some roots. All right, let's take our sweaty selves out to the front native section and pot up some more babies. All right, my sweet friends, thank you so much for joining me in the front gardens. So this is a little volunteer fekahatchee grass that just shot up <laughs> and it's right next to big mama fekahatchee grass. So she's putting out seeds right now. What happened is the seeds just dropped in right here and one of them took hold. The problem with it being where it is, is that it's literally three inches from <laughs> the edge and um, that's no good. So it'll just impede the driveway. So I'm just going to pop her right up out of the ground. And I think the pot I brought is a little on the small side, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm just going to make some room in this little pot. So I have just these little, I, I you know, when you're a gardener and you buy plants, you just have an accumulation of these little pots so I reuse them over and over and over again and actually I have friends who when I give them plants they'll actually give me the pots back which is very nice so little pot and then same principle you're just going to go in and try to get as much now these put out a little they, they do have quite a little root ball on them and I another reason why it's good to get to them early so you just take your shovel and you try to get underneath of that little root ball and give them a little pry and just kind of go all the way around and do that and then again I stick my hand up underneath of where I feel the the kind of the bottom of the root ball is. And sometimes you're, you're just gonna damage some roots. There's just not, not, no getting around that. Yep, that pot was way too big because like I said, these tend to put out a little root ball. So that is a little baby uh, Fakahachi grass plant. And I don't really need another Fakahachi grass, a big one like this. Or maybe I do, I haven't quite decided. So either I'm going to find a place to put this here in the native wildlife area, or I will give it to someone at the Florida Native Plant Society meeting who will appreciate it. So yeah, so we just, I may knock off some of this to be able to get it into the pot because all of this isn't necessary. And then, yeah, no, that pot's too small. So I'm gonna have to transplant this to a larger pot because I don't wanna start it out in the wrong environment. So we'll take this back and put it in a bigger pot. But that's essentially how you transplant little volunteer plants. It's really easy. Just take some care, try to get them into their new situation as quickly as you possibly can, whether it be a pot or a new location in your garden and make sure they're watered and moist for at least a couple of weeks, unless it's raining. And yeah, free plants, who doesn't love that? All right, my sweet friends, so the last plant that I'm going to try to propagate today is this plant behind me, Tythonia diversifolia, or Mexican sunflower. I've also heard it called Bolivian sunflower. I talked about this plant in previous videos. It's a workhorse for our system. Now, I've also mentioned this in other videos that UF has predicted this plant to be an invasive in the future. They don't think it's invasive now, but it could become one in the future. And the reason for that, I suppose, is because it has the ability to reseed. We bought a sterile cultivar, but sterility in nature is kind of a joke in my professional opinion. They also root 
at the nodes. So if one of these canes or stalks were to fall over onto the ground, it will root down at each of the nodes and then shoot little plantlets, you know, little plants up um, from those nodes as well. So that could be another reason why that is. So I just, just a word of caution, be responsible <laughs> with this plant. We generally never let it go to flower, but never say never, it does happen. We have come out here and oops, a flower, but it has never been weedy on, in our space. They tend to stay where we put them. We have never had it reseed, but they do grow very easily from cuttings, which is how we have been able to take one plant and turn it into a dozen or more. So I'll show you how we do that. Now I just take, sometimes when you have this plant and you look at it, you can see little root, purple rootlets or root hairs coming out at the base of where it's coming off of the mother plant. And I live in the city, you guys, and I just heard a fire truck, so bear with me on the sound. No. And I see that right here, as a matter of fact. So this is pretty green, this little cutting that I took here. It's pretty green, but if you'll notice at the base here, there's these two little root, purple root hairs that are coming out and there's ants on my hat. So there's these two little purple rootlets right here. And so if I stick this in some soil, um, whether it be just directly in the ground, which I tend to do, or stick it into a pot, those roots will be stimulated to grow and this will become a separate little plant. And you can do that with, with most of these. I tend to take thicker, cuttings. I'll take, this is about the size of a pencil, a good size pencil, but I tend to take them when they're the size of my thumb, the cuttings for Tithonia. I tend to, to, to take bigger stalks of this. I just feel they do better. Um, they have more energy, so they tend to root, root more nicely, but this is just fine for propagation. So again, stick it in some soil, keep it moist for a couple of weeks. You'll have lovely roots, and then you can uh, either give that to a friend, tell them to be responsible too, or just plant it in your garden. So that is how you propagate Tithonia diversifolia. Okay, my friends, so I filmed myself earlier making my alfalfa meal tea that I do, but it started raining and the audio cut out. It was just not great. So that video had to be had to be tanked but i will sh just kind of take you through it and describe to you what i did so i'm going to flip the camera around so that i can show you back here in our storage kind of an area how we make and store our alfalfa meal and our compost tea because this is where we do that as well okay so as i mentioned i'm actually in our uh, back corner of the garden where our um, air conditioner is and this is where we store our mulch and we actually we need more this is where i store my compost so this is where we store our compost tea and it would do much better in a sunnier environment it would process faster but sun full sun uh, that's for growing plants so this space back here was just a perfect uh, situation, to, you know, to, for storage because I can't grow anything back here. So we just store things, including my compost tea. So I have two black 20 gallon trash cans that we keep our compost tea in. And I make compost tea just kind of regularly throughout the year. It's not like on a set schedule or anything. It's honestly when I have the materials and time to do it. So it's summertime. We're doing alfalfa meal tea because I want to help my annual area along before we start planting for the summertime. And I use a pelleted form of alfalfa. I get it online in bulk and I always try to do organic whenever possible. Now this is what it looks like after a day. So if I were to spread those pellets just directly into the garden, it might attract things. It might attract, you know, little fuzzies and things like that because they feed alfalfa meal to livestock and, you know, things like that. So, or, you know, the pelleted form. So <laughs> I didn't want to create that situation. So I ferment it first. And then that also just gives me a nice liquid fertilizer because what happens is whatever nutrients that alfalfa teal alfalfa meal contains the water soluble elements they are released into the water and then 
I take that water solution, which I will just move some of this out of the way so you can see it's actually liquid. So I take that liquid and I just feed the garden with it. And then I'll take this, what I consider over time spent material. I will also just kind of spread that around my fruit trees. This, this time around, it's going into the annual area. And I will leave this sit for, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes six weeks, um, depending. Sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's six weeks. Now, just keep in mind, this is a fermentation process to an extent. It becomes anaerobic, it stinks. Now, the longer you allow it to kind of process and break down, the less that smell, you know, the less there is that smell, but it is a little stinky. It has kind of a sour kind of fermentation, kind of a, a manure-ish kind of a smell as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Whenever we spread it, it only lasts for maybe a day. And I have super wonderful neighbors and I, I warn them ahead of time that, hey, we're spreading some, you know, we're spreading some alfalfa meal or compost tea or whatever throughout the garden. So, you know, just so they're like, what the heck? These are wonderful nutrients. It's like feeding your plants a whole food diet instead of giving them granular fertilizers, which act more like a multivitamin. This actually contains a root stimulating hormone and I'm terrible with pronunciation. So I'll just put the name of that particular hormone on the screen for you. But it also has other, you know, vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that plants need. It's also a high source of nitrogen. So if your plants are lacking a bit of nitrogen, alfalfa meal tea can be a good solution for that. So this is how, this is how we make it. The recipe for it, I will leave in the description. Eh, I do, sometimes I do a cup to five gallons. Sometimes I'll do two cups per five gallons of water. And I, the two cups per five gallons, or I'm sorry, yeah, two cups of alfalfa meal to five gallons of water has worked out really well. And I believe this is what I've done in this formulation. It's two cups of alfalfa meal per every five gallons of water and we don't experience any burns or anything like that when we use that particular concentration so one cup to five gallons or two cups to five gallons depending that's what we have been historically using so that's how we make our alfalfa meal tea i just pour the alfalfa meal into the bottom of the trash can and then i measure it out you know pour it in and then i just fill it up with water from our well or from our rain barrels all right, so I had my plant babies. It was a good day in the garden. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. It was lovely to have you. If you're interested in this kind of content, growing food in an urban environment, planting natives for wildlife, come on the journey with us. Give us a like, hit subscribe, and I hope to see you again on another Peaceful Bird Gardens. Have a lovely day, my sweet friends.